guys, thanks everyone so much for coming. Uh, this is the first of our engineering series of meetups. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of IO's meetups in the past, we've had great success engaging with the communities uh, across development uh, of, of IT technology, but now we're moving into the engineering side of things. So as a company, we specialize uh, across all areas of engineering, um, embed electronics, R&D and manufacturing, and we, we operate across the UK and Europe and are starting to open up into other areas of the world as well. Uh, sorry, uh, what's what's your business? It's IO Associates. Uh, sorry, what what business are you in? Uh, recruitment, we do. Okay, got it. Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that, that's probably enough about us anyway. I think this is um it's it's more about Tiff and um and, and the gender diversity chat. So um, we've got Tiff Dawson in. Tiff is an ex mechanical engineer. Uh, she's her career coach um, for women in, in STEM. And she's going to give us a, a talk about diversity um, and yeah, to just go through why it matters and, and what we can do to, to help it. So, yeah, enough about us. Tiff, do you want to fire away? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and for helping me to share this really important message. And thank you all so much for investing your morning with us this morning to think about this really important topic. So for those of you who don't know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths. I'll be using this term throughout the talk. If you forget, just, chat, um, just type in the chat box and we can give you a reminder. But to start off with, I know that gender diversity is a really tricky topic to broach, especially in the corporate world, which is probably why most of you are here today. And I want to assure you that most business leaders feel really disempowered when it comes to improving gender diversity. So if you're feeling this way, don't worry, you're not alone. And I'll be giving you a couple of you know, stats and bits of information that you can take back to your workplaces to start a really healthy conversation about it. But, you know, I think a lot of business leaders are afraid of making a mistake. So they're afraid of saying the wrong thing or putting the wrong uh, policy in place or wrong initiative in place in their workplace and it might leave someone out or offend someone. It is a really scary topic to broach at times. But the worst thing you can do is to be so scared that you don't do anything. <laughs> but the best thing you can do is to try something. So to put something in place in your workplace, to try something and be open about the fact that you don't have all the answers, even if you're a business leader, even if you feel that you should know everything, because nobody has gotten it right. Even, you know, the top tech and engineering companies no one has got this gender diversity stuff right yet. And it is up to us to experiment and be open to feedback, be transparent to staff that you're learning along with them and that you're open to changing things. So this talk will equip you with some of that knowledge to start conversations in a positive manner. By the end of this talk, you will walk away with a few key things in your tool belts. One is the understanding of the current gender balance landscape in engineering in the UK, why it matters, so what the benefits are to you, to your workplace, to all the staff who work with you. Three, why gender inequality still exists. For a lot of us, it seems as if this topic has been floating around and be been talked about for ages. So why are we still in this position after so long? And finally, the golden nugget, what you can personally do about it. I want to preface this talk by saying firstly that I am not a gender diversity expert. I'm not a diversity and inclusion expert or anything like that. But I was a mechanical engineer. So um, what I did was I worked in, as a mechanical engineer in the construction industry for about eight years. I designed heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems for all sorts of different buildings. I'd say my most bragworthy building was the Stonehenge Visitor Center. So if you've ever been there and felt like the temperature was totally on point, then that was me. <laughs> um, it's a funny kind of business to be in because if you do your job right, then it means that no one notices your work at all. <laughs> 
So that was what I did for about eight years across Australia and the UK. But now I work as a career coach and I do career coaching for, um, yeah, so for women in STEM who are generally in their mid to senior levels of their careers. And I teach them frameworks to become three things, confident, strategy savvy and influential leaders. So this is where I help them to really elevate from where they are right now into the leaders that they want to be and maybe leaders who they might not have role models for because let's face it, it is a very male dominated environment. And for us women, we don't often have the relatable role models that men might have. So I'm overgeneralizing here, I know, but that is a massive problem in the engineering industry. It's really hard for women to see where their lives and where their careers would take them because they can't kind of visualize what that would look like for them. So I do three main things. First is career development workshops. So I provide workshops for the likes of YouTube, Hargraves Lansdowne and Bureau Happold. And here is where I teach tools to help them increase their value quickly in the workplace. So this is to equip them so they can help themselves in the workplace if they don't have those relatable role models or mentors available to them. I guess my most um, popular topics that I provide workshops on are imposter syndrome and how to overcome it and how to self-promote. These are both things that a lot of women in male-dominated workplaces struggle with. And all they need is a little bit of guidance and a few frameworks to help them along the way. I also provide private leadership coaching, and this is one-on-one coaching for women at mid-level all the way up to directorship level and also speaking engagements like what I'm doing today. I also have a podcast. So this is aimed at women in STEM. It's called How to Be a Steminist. And this is where I talk about lots of different career tips for women to take into their workplaces. So if you're a woman in STEM or you know someone who could do with a bit of guidance but don't really want to reach out for coaching just yet, this is a really good resource for them. But enough about me, I'm going to go on to talk about our topic today. All the slides will be available right here for you to download. You can do that right now if you wanted to www.tiffanydawson.co forward slash IO associates. You can fill in a couple of details and find the slides here. I've also left a link in there to book a call with me if you are in a position where you'd like to discuss how to better support your female talent in your workplace. So that is all there for you, plus a couple of extra resources, which I thought you might find interesting. So go ahead and copy that address down so you can download the slides later on. Right, on to my first point, which is the current gender balance landscape. So here I'm going to share some stats and figures about, yeah, I guess, how many women compared with men are working in STEM right now. Okay, so over the past 10 years, we have increased the percentage of women in engineering in the UK. All of these stats are from WISE campaign, which you can look up all their reports and stats there if you're interested. So at the moment, we're not doing that well, are we? (laughs) We're at 10.4%. Yes, we've gotten better, but it's not really saying a lot. Let's compare that to tech. So I've left tech in there. I know most of you are from the engineering um, fields, but some of you may have, you know, data analysts and software developers within your firms as well. So it's useful for you to know what's going on in tech. There are more women as a percentage in tech, but it's gotten worse over the last five years, which is really surprising. So engineering still has some work to do. I don't know what's happening with tech, but it's gotten a little bit worse. Let's hope this trend doesn't continue. And as a comparison for the whole of STEM, 
it's actually not too bad. Well, it is kind of not great, but um, so you can see here in 2020 for all of STEM, so science, tech, engineering, and maths, we're at 24.2% females working in those fields. However, it is because science has skewed that number. So science is almost at 50% women and 50% men. But from me speaking to a lot of women in science, I know for a fact that a lot of those women are not in the most senior positions. So it seems to be very male heavy at the top and female heavy at the bottom. Let's see if that changes over the next few years. A few extra things that you might be interested to know. 57% of females drop out of engineering by the age of 45 compared to 17% of males. This is a problem <laughs> because we are struggling to get more females into leadership roles, right? And this is about the time when women become senior enough or experienced enough to reach directorship level or to reach board level if they are mostly dropping out before the age of 45, then we're missing out on that. In tech, I couldn't find this stat for the UK, but in the US, 50% of women drop out of the tech industry by the age of 35. And if you're really sad like me and you love reading gender uh, pay gap reports, then you'll see in most STEM companies that the higher paid quartiles have a lower percentage of women. So by that, I mean, they split each um, company up into quartiles of being paid. So the lowest paid quartile would be, you know, the graduates and entry level people. The people get paid the most would be the highest paid quartile. So as we go further up into leadership, you have less women. But why does it matter, right? What are the actual benefits to gender equality? It's really hard for us to produce any sort of change if we don't know why we're even doing it in the first place. So gender equality is a really difficult topic to broach anyway. If we don't know why we're doing it, it's really hard to change beliefs and behaviors around it. So here are a couple of things that are benefits. Firstly, there is a massive, massive gap when it comes to skills in STEM in the UK. So if you're in HR or you're an engineering manager or you're in recruitment, you will know that good quality engineers are really, really hard to come by. There's a massive shortage. There's a stat that says that every single year, 59,000 more engineers are needed. And I also read just yesterday that new STEM roles are expected to double in the next 10 years. So as we said before, the most difficult group to recruit for are senior levels. And that's also when most females, uh, female engineers drop out. We literally cannot afford any more women dropping out at those levels because we don't have enough of them. The next benefit to gender diversity and diversity as a whole, in fact, is diversity of thought. So it's not just the fact of having more women in the workplace is better or having more people of color in the workplace is better. It's that diversity of thought that is the real thing that matters and makes a big difference. So there's a study that's been done where they tested the problem solving capabilities of a homogenous group of people. So people of all similar backgrounds and ages and a diverse group of people. The homogenous group of people they found when they were solving the same problem, these two groups of people, the homogenous group of people, so people of all similar backgrounds, they made more mistakes than 
the diverse group of people and the diverse group of people came up with more innovative solutions. The theory behind this is that mistakes are often made if you don't question each other enough. And if you are all from similar backgrounds, you won't really question each other as much as if you come from different backgrounds because you all probably just assume that the other person is correct. Diverse background people, they will come from all different types of life experiences and come with different solutions and maybe some crazy ideas, which means that they all have to question each other and make sure that things are done correctly and they come up with new ideas together. Personally, I have experienced this. So in the first engineering company that I worked for, I could see that the leadership team, they all came from similar backgrounds. They all went to private, like the same private schools back in Australia. Um, they had all come up through from graduate level all the way to directorship. They hadn't moved companies at all. So they were all the same type of person. And they seem to always say things like, oh yeah, we need to do it this way because we've always done it this way. Or if someone came up with a new idea, they'd be like, no, we don't do it this way. It's too risky or whatnot. It really got me thinking that I wonder if other companies do things differently. So that curiosity grew so much in me that I ended up moving. I moved to a different company, which I knew had a leadership team of all different sorts of people, different ages, different educational backgrounds. Some didn't, hadn't gotten an engineering degree at all and they were directors. Some were from different countries and English wasn't their strongest language. And I don't think it's any coincidence that that second workplace won a lot more innovation awards than the first. The next thing I'm going to talk about is shopping. <laughs> so it's probably not that surprising to you to, for me to say that women in the UK hold the largest portion of buying power throughout the country. But you might not know what the statistics are. So women will either make the purchase or influence the purchase of 92% of holidays, 65% of cars, 93% of food, 91% of homes, and 61% of computers. If you work in an engineering or tech company that are in any of these fields or produce products for these um, industries, and you don't have a woman on your design team, then you're really missing out on maybe producing a product or a service that a woman wants to use or a woman wants to purchase. So you might be opening yourself up to massive knowledge gaps when it comes to trends in these markets and all that kind of stuff. Having a diverse range of people, especially women who hold these um, massive portions of buying power in these fields is so important. The next thing that gender diversity brings is staff engagement. So lots of studies are out there that show the more diversity in the workplace, the higher the staff engagement. And we all know that good staff engagement means less sick days, more productivity, better efficiency, and all of the good things that come with that, along with just a happier workforce and a happier workplace to go into every day. And because of all of those reasons I've just mentioned, companies with better gender diversity have increased revenue. So gender diversity is not just a nice to have, it's not just some corporate social responsibility thing that you should tick off your to-do list. It is a business decision it makes business sense to make this a priority. Okay, but why are we still in this situation? Why does gender inequality still exist? It seems like this is a topic that's been talked about and talked about for so, so, so long. Why are we still in this position? 
And to explain this, I need to take you through a slight journey through history. So just bear with me here. I'm no historian, but here are a couple of facts um, and timelines that might be interesting to you. So in 1964, not that long ago, the Married Women's Property Act was approved. So women were finally allowed to keep half of any savings from the allowance given by her husband. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> so really not that long ago. Next in 1970, working women are still refused mortgages without a signature of a male guarantor. The significance of this is that in our day and age, the only two things we need to survive in our society is a roof over our heads and access to money, to buy food, to buy essentials, all that kind of stuff. We're no longer in those caveman days where we've got saber-toothed tigers trying to chase us down. These are literally the two things we need to survive. And if a woman couldn't access housing without approval of a man, then she's really powerless. She can't survive in this world without males in her life. And she doesn't have that, um, yeah, I guess, right to live in a house without a male guarantor. 1975, we're getting closer and closer. The Sex Discrimination Act was finally approved. So it's finally illegal to discriminate against women in work, education and training. Before this date, it was totally normal. It was totally okay to do so. You could discriminate against women just for being a woman. Another thing happened this year, which is the Employment Protection Act. It's finally illegal to fire a woman due to pregnancy. I know in our day and age, this sounds shocking that you could do this, but this was normal practice. A workplace could find out that a woman was pregnant and just say, okay, well, you're pregnant, so you're going to be without a job. Again, this is significant because without a job, that's no money and They've lost their ability to kind of live a life. 1980. Did you know that it was only in 1980 that women could apply for credit cards and loans? Again, it's about that access to money to buy essentials. And then in 1985, women are allowed to be paid the same as men for work of equal value. So it wasn't allowed before. And finally, in 1990, the um, independent taxation law was passed where women could be taxed separately from their husbands before they were treated as one financial pot. The point I'm trying to make here is that all of this stuff happened not that long ago. And I know that decades have passed since then, but there is what I call a cultural lag. So all of these massive things happened for women's rights in the last couple of decades and in the last two to three generations, maybe two generations. There's a cultural lag because our beliefs and behaviours take generations to change. This is because we learn how to behave from, firstly, when we're first born as babies, we learn how to behave in, in the world from our parents, from the generation before. So if our parents grew up in times where it was okay to fire a woman due to pregnancy, then maybe... On some subconscious level, women in our generation have learned that once you become pregnant, then your career goes out the door. And I know this is a belief with so many of the women I coach. I still get 
women who have just graduated from uni come to me saying, okay, I need to get my career in order right now because when I have a baby, I won't be able to do anything further. This is still a belief and a fear of a lot of women these days. Our parents, who do they learn their behaviours from? Their parents who lived through the previous set of laws. So unless you've done a lot of therapy and a lot of self um, awareness coaching, then you probably still hold beliefs and behaviors that you're not aware of that you have borrowed from your parents and that they have borrowed from their parents. So there is this cultural lag and it takes ages for behaviors around stuff like gender diversity to come through. And if we rely on beliefs and behaviors to change by themselves over time, it's going to take too long. We don't have that kind of time. We saw from the stats before that there aren't enough engineers to fill in what we need over the next 10 years. We can't afford to lose any more women. Now, this is the point where you might start to feel really disempowered. <laughs> I can't do anything about this past. But yeah, look, it's not all doom and gloom. You, all of you attending here today, you are all in a position to do something about it to fast track this change before it's too late. So on to the best part, what you can do about it. And I'm going to talk to a few different groups of people here. The first are leaders. So if you are a leader in your business, in any sense of the word, then this is what you can do. The best and most impactful thing that you can do as a business leader in engineering is to walk the walk. And by that, I mean being a good example that stuff like flexible working policies are okay to take. So, you know, if you do have flexible working policies in your workplace and none of the leadership team are taking them up, then what message is that sending to the junior staff? Oh, if I want to become a leader and to be taken seriously, then it's not allowed for me to take this. I can give you an example from my own engineering career. In one of the offices that I worked in, there was a flexible working policy in our contracts, but it was this unwritten rule that you really shouldn't take it. None of the leadership took it. None of the management team below them took it. So none of us would take it as junior people, members of staff. It wasn't until our office manager, his personal circumstances changed. So his wife ended up going back to university. And one day in an all staff meeting, he announced to the whole office, he said, okay, every Wednesday afternoon, I need to leave early to pick the kids up from, um, from school because my wife is going back to university. So I will be uncontactable from 2 p.m. every Wednesday. And he did this visibly and it changed everything overnight. Everyone finally felt it was okay for them to take on flexible working policies. So just be really wary about some of the messages that you are sending out based on your actions. Another thing that leaders can do if you are involved in hiring is that first of all, be aware that it takes more time and effort to find women to hire into the roles that you have open. So there are women out there. It just takes more effort to find them. And I know there are women out there because I get women come to me every single day saying I'm having trouble finding a job. I'm not saying to lower your standards and to hire someone who is not equipped for the role. I'm saying to look harder, to spend more time. They're out there. Speak to your recruiters and say that this is important and it's okay if it takes a bit more time. Have those conversations. The other thing you can do is to support the existing female talent that you have. So you probably have some female uh, engineers who work for you. What are you doing to retain them? If it's so hard to hire them in, 
do everything you can to retain them, give them support, give them coaching, give them whatever they need to develop into the leaders you need them to be in your company. I spoke to a big financial company recently and they came to me saying, we're so proud. We have managed to hire 10 women into our um, tech team over the last 12 months. And when we delved a bit deeper, we also found out that 11 women left the tech team over the last 12 months. So if it takes extra time, money and effort to hire women in, do whatever you can to keep the women that you already have. The next group of people I wanna to talk to are men. I know that a lot of men feel disempowered to do anything about gender equality because they feel it's not their place. They don't want to sound like they're being disrespectful or that they know what women are going through. So they end up doing nothing at all. So I totally understand that. If you're feeling that way, here are a couple of practical things that you can do. So the first is to not assume that the only woman in your workplace doesn't want to do something that all, the, all your mates are doing. I've come into engineering companies before where I've been the only woman in the team. And I could tell that on a Friday afternoon when the boys were all organizing to go out to the pub for a beer or go out for lunch, they really thought twice about inviting me, not because they were horrible people or wanted to leave me out, but they didn't want me to feel uncomfortable. They didn't want me to feel left out because I was the only woman. They didn't know if I would enjoy going to the pub. Luckily, I was outspoken enough and I just said, hey, can I come along? And I invited myself along. And after that first time, they were really happy to like just ask me off the cuff anytime something happened. So my message to you is don't assume that a minority doesn't want to get involved in something ask them give them the option for example I worked in a team that had um, a team member with obvious religious backgrounds and we knew he didn't drink and the first few times we went out to the pub we didn't ask him along and I always felt this pang of guilt I'm like I don't want to ask him because he doesn't drink at the end we asked him along he really loved being there he just didn't order an alcoholic drink like how simple is that he came with us every single time he wanted to get involved so don't assume just ask and give them the option the second practical thing you can do is to help amplify a woman's voice Lots of women will have experienced being talked over by a man in a meeting. And we can assume all sorts of different reasons for this, but I like to use the facts. Most of the time, generally speaking, women have a higher voice than a man um, and generally a little bit softer. So their voice is physically harder to hear over a man's booming deep voice. Um, this is something that I learned in um, my engineering degree as well. When we, had to, we, when we had to learn about sound engineering, a deeper sound is easier to hear over a high pitched sound. So if you can start becoming cognizant of the fact that women are often being spoken over in meetings, and maybe they have been spoken over so many times that they've given up speaking up in meetings at all. Just be aware of the women in that meeting room with you, whether that's on Zoom or in a physical meeting room. If you can see that she wants to say something or if she's been spoken over, just try and point the attention of the room to that woman. So you can say something like, Tim, I can see that Angela has something important to say. Can we listen to your point after Angela's made her point? That's all it takes. And you will not understand how much a woman will appreciate your help in using your voice to amplify hers. The next group of people I'm going to talk to are women. So what can you do for other women? The first thing you can do is to 
be there for other women, be visible, get to know them, build that trusting relationship with them. If you don't work in a team with other women, get to know women in other teams and start building that, you know, friendly, not, not necessarily a formal mentoring relationship, but even just checking in and saying hi or sending them a Slack message or, or Skype message every now and then saying, how are you? What's going on? Because when a woman has a challenge that they're going through that they feel they can't speak to their male peers about, maybe they will come and reach out to you instead because you've built that trusting relationship. Another thing you can do is to join a women's group for female engineers or women in your industry. There are plenty of them around. That is a place where you can give support and receive support in a really positive way. Um, also, it doesn't need to be a physical meetup or an organization. There are lots of online groups as well. I have my own Facebook group called Wonder Women in STEM. So any women in engineering out there listening, you're very welcome to join. This is a really casual place where you can ask for help, receive help, find out what other women in, in STEM are thinking at the time, what challenges they're going through, and you can pitch in whenever you want to. Finally, what can women do for themselves? The best thing you can do for yourself is to invest in yourself, to develop yourself. Don't assume that your workplace will do it all for you. I think especially in engineering, and this is my own experience as well, we expect our workplaces to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to personal and professional development. If you want to learn something, do it. If your workplace isn't going to help you do it or if, if you know, they, they don't have the resources to help you at the time, look elsewhere. See if you can develop yourself elsewhere. You can't rely on your workplace to parent you for your whole career. At some point, you need to get up off your own back and really, yeah, develop yourself and invest in yourself. The things you need to do to move into senior levels is to develop your confidence, your strategic thinking and your influencing skills. These are the three things you can do to invest in yourself to move up and become a strong female role model. If you're facing a problem, seek help. Speak to someone, whether that is a man or a woman in your workplace, find a mentor or find a coach, speak to me. I'll, I'll have my uh, contact details at the last slide here. Just speak up, ask for help. I think we are often so ashamed of even having a problem in the first place that we don't speak up about it. But, you know, there's no extra points for people who struggle through a problem by themselves. Just ask for help. And the reason I say this is so important, and this is not just for women, <laughs> for you to create a career that you love is because this is the best way we can encourage more people to come into the STEM industries, to start joining engineering as a career. If you are all seen to absolutely love your jobs, that you have a life outside of work, that you enjoy every second you do at work and you're working on something that is really aligned with your values and your purpose in life, then what better adver uh, ad advertisement for engineering is there than just you loving life every single day? So that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you have taken away some stats and figures to start conversations, to share with your colleagues. You're very welcome to download these slides and to share them with your colleagues. I would love for you to start a conversation using the information here. Um, and yeah, reach out to me if you have any 
questions. Um, I know that we're going to be taking questions very soon. These are the ways in which you can contact me. So there's my website, um, my social media accounts and my podcast. If you do have a question that you're afraid to ask in front of everyone today, I'm very happy for you to email me directly. Um, but yeah, handing it back over. Thanks for listening. Amazing, Tiff. Thank you very much, guys. I've got a couple of questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, one from Dave and one from Angus. We'll, we'll start with those. If you've got a question in the meantime, can you just pop it in the chat and then, and then we'll get through to it. Um, otherwise, once we finish those, we, will, um, we, we can put some hands up, I guess. Um, the qu first question from Dave Davis, uh, Tiff, is over recent years, I've heard STEAM being talked about more often to include arts in the STEM arena, uh, particularly design, partly to attract a wider, a wider range of students into engineering. Um, do you see merit in this approach and would it help or hinder gender diversity? Yeah, this is really interesting. I, I've definitely um, noticed STEAM being talked about a lot more recently. Um, look, I, I, I don't know if it's going to work. I, I think this is one of those things where we have to try something to see if it does help. Um, definitely at the moment, art still seems like more of, more of a feminine type um, type of topic and subject to study at school so yeah it, it might help to attract students who don't necessarily see themselves as like the mathsy or sciencey type of person um, there seems to be this misconception that if you go into engineering then you have to be like this not creative type of person at all but really, you need to be very creative to be in engineering. If you're solving the world's biggest problems, you need to have that creativity. So I do hope that adding in the arts will encourage more creative people into these fields. But yeah, I, I'm not sure if it will work. I guess time will tell. Awesome. Dave, does that answer, answer your question for you? Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, next question was from Angus, um, Angus Condi. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, do you think that with more homeworking um, as a positive outcome, sorry, do you think that with more homeworking as a positive outcome from the COVID-19 crisis will help gender diversity? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. I've heard, um, I guess, both sides of the coin with this. I personally think that working from home and, and everyone getting used to the fact that you can work from home has increased the ability for companies to trust their staff to work from home. So, yeah, maybe that will help with some of the child caring activities that fall that still fall on a lot of women's shoulders in relationships these days. Um, the other thing that has come out of COVID-19 is that a lot of women had requested to go on furlough or have been taken out of their jobs because they are the primary caregivers in their households. So now their careers have been set back by, you know, six to 12 months. And not just that, going back into um, work after a long period of furlough means their confidence is probably a lot lower as well. So that takes them back however many years. They might be seen differently in the workplace because they've taken so much time off. So yeah, I, I guess there's two sides of it. I do really hope that working, this whole working from home thing does have a positive outcome overall. Um, like a lot of tech companies, I know they're now just shutting their physical offices altogether and everyone's remote. So yeah, may, maybe this will help, but yeah, there, there's positives and negatives to the crisis in terms of gender diversity. Yeah, good question. Pat. Um, next one, Megan Hazel. I think there's probably probably one more I can answer, to be honest. Uh, as a recruiter, what would you suggest for discussing gender diversity with clients when they request a male engineer? Um, yeah, good question. It's not actually one that, that really comes up very often. Debbie, that's also a very good point that that is, I, I think that is illegal. I don't think you can request, as we discussed earlier 
in the presentation from TIFF that I don't think you can request a male engineer or, or a female engineer. Um, yeah, behind the scenes, we do get asked quite a lot by by, by companies to, to help push through female engineers. Uh, we do have quotas with some clients. Um, but when, when it comes to that question, is somebody requesting a male engineer, I, I don't think that would be the kind of client we'd like to work with, to, to be honest. And I think it'd be something that yeah, I'd, I'd probably push back quite strongly on. But yeah, I think it, it probably, a suggestion for me would probably be to do a little bit of learning about women in engineering, uh, maybe speak to TIFF and, and push them their way. But yeah, that would be my answer to that one. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question, Megan? I, I think mute. to add to that, um, you know, yeah, that like a lot of engineering companies now have quotas and they are trying to get more women into their um, roles, which is a really good thing to see because that at least forces people to spend a bit more time and effort finding those women. But it's also not a good thing for anyone, even the woman, if you place her in a role that she's not ready for, because you're setting her up for failure, you're setting up her team to be resentful of her and be resentful of female engineers. So yeah, just, I think we really need to use our common sense when it comes to this, try your best to look for a female to, to fill that role but don't put a female who's not ready into that role because that hinders things even more. Yeah, very good, very good point. Um, good question as well. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dave Davis with another one. Um, my experience has been that the influence of parents and teachers is key. How can we better engage them and change their preconceptions? I've been thinking about this a lot in my spare time. Um, <laughs> this is this is not a, a practical answer but I honestly think that we need a tv show about engineers because there seems to be tv shows about you know law firms and um, hospitals and all that kind of stuff and it gives a bit more exposure to people of yeah I know it's dramatized but it gives people a bit more exposure as to you know that's a work field that you can go to and it's in the media no one makes a tv show about engineering <laughs> but anyway I, I don't work in the tv industry so I probably can't influence that but um I guess in terms of teachers yeah it's really important and there are volunteer organizations that all of you can get involved in so um stem learning runs stem ambassadors where they get people who work in the field or have worked in the field um, in STEM to go and talk about their work experiences to the kids and to the teachers in those schools or to do really cool fun activities relating to STEM there as well. Um, in terms of parents, I think th this is a really tricky one for me to answer because I guess parents hang out in all sorts of different forums. So um, yeah, whether that is suggesting, you know, if you have children or have links to a school, suggesting to the school whether you could go in and do a special event or speak at an assembly um, about your career and why that's important, that's probably something you can personally do to help influence parents and teachers to learn more about what engineering actually is. Um, there's this misconception that an engineer is just um, the guy who comes around to fix your printer when it breaks down, but uh, it's so much more than that. And we work on such interesting, life-changing projects. So if you can find a way to inspire parents and teachers um, and find out where they hang out and give those talks, then that's probably something you can personally do. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a few comments on this as well. And I, th I, think, I think everyone's sort of agreeing. And I, th I think um, Kevin's put a Put a note. I think it's a collaborative approach that we can do as industry and, and I guess recruiters and um, and people like yourself as well, Tiff. So I think there's, there's some things everyone can do to impact it from as young a age as possible. Really, um, yeah. Good, good question. Uh, next question from Hamza. Uh, any steps or recommendations from you to follow to ensure unconscious bias does not impact diversity inclusion when hiring? So. I'm not a diversity expert or an unconscious bias expert. So there are people who are much more qualified than me to answer that, that question. If, if you would like me to connect you with some of those people, please do send me an email and I'm happy to do that. Um, 
In terms of a couple of things I have seen that worked well in my own engineering career, one was, I guess, um, you know, in one of the companies that I worked in, it was policy that in any sort of interview panel that there had to be at least one female as part of that panel. And that was a really easy thing to implement. Um, it gave women some experience in, you know, interviewing and hiring as well. And that at least gives you a different perspective um, on top of a male's perspective. So that's one simple thing. There are lots of, uh, I guess, other companies that are doing things to help with um, eliminating unconscious bias when it comes to hiring as well. So yeah, let me know if that's something that you're interested in learning more about and I can share some resources or people I can connect you with. Awesome. I think that's all the questions we've got um, on the chat. Does anybody got any more questions at the moment? Anybody want to fire any questions over at all? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So just, just one thing, I think. it's um, So obviously, I think in terms of the seats, how they're laid at school, I think that's, that's a real concern because, again, at TT Electronics, we do a lot of outreach in terms of the local schools in South Wales, and I know as a global company we do as well. And I think it's really sad to see really girls being almost like pre-programmed to fail. Um, mm. And it was really apparent prior to COVID, went to a school in South Wales and we did a, um, a trade and STEM fair there. And um, the guys came over, you'd have the usual engagement. The girls hung back and made a point of going out and speaking and reaching out. And when you speak with them, really, their, their aspirations, you know, were they, they, they were just, they, they needed recalibrating really. That You know, the world was a rooster, and, and they could be far more than, you know, a single mum at 20, which is, again, because of the demographic of the area, yeah. that was the issue, and that's sad. Just one quick one that I just wanted to say is it also, as well, I think, as a man, I think um, I find it difficult sometimes because uh, I put in a, um, an example about the fire service uh, where, where, again, the... I've seen the tables turned where there's been discrete, uh, direct discrimination against good male candidates and it's caused resentment. And I think that's something people need to be really conscious of, again, to your point of just ticking a box for percentages as opposed to the right person for the role. And the sad thing is, and I know of several ladies in the fire service, which is not my industry, but it's, a, it's one of my relatives. And no matter what that lady then does, she's always going to be demonized by the fact that, oh, well, you've got the role because of your um, gender, which is mm. so sad because, you know, again, you know, almost doomed to fail from the start and no matter what, what she does, you know, and it, I, I find that very, very sad. I think it's about getting the balance right, isn't it? You know, so it's uh, not disingenuous. Yeah, absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. That resentment does come when you favour women over men just to reach a target or to tick a box. We still need to use our brains when we're hiring people. You, you know, you wouldn't hire anybody for the job just because, you know, you need to hire someone to fill a purpose, to fill a role, to fill a skill gap. So make sure that that's filled and also... I guess leadership have a lot of responsibility in educating their staff as to what they're doing. So being really transparent about it. So I would assume that in that particular workplace, maybe the leadership weren't that transparent about it and people had to make assumptions that this woman was hired just because of her, um, her gender. But if you can educate your staff members and say, we are trying our best to increase the diversity in our company, this is what we're going to do, but we're going to make sure that all these criteria or all, all these things need to be met before we hire them or that a skill gap or a cultural gap is filled so that we hire them, then I guess that kind of takes away that excuse for people moaning and complaining that a woman has been hired for a specific role. Um, I guess before we close off, there is one important thing that I'd like to mention, and this happens every time I give this talk, I get a lot of questions about how do we get more children, like more girls involved, how do we encourage them into um, studying STEM, and all of that work is 
needed and I encourage you to continue doing that. But the gap I see is that people in STEM organizations like yourselves, you miss out a lot on the retention of women in your own workplace. So we're kind of trying to reach further afield and trying to educate these girls to study STEM. But actually the most impactful thing you can do is in your own backyard. So how can you retain the women who are already there? Because I think someone was mentioning before, uh, maybe it was Kevin saying that we're almost setting these girls up for failure. If these girls get really interested in STEM and they want to join STEM fields later on in life, but there are no female role models for them to support them, then we are still setting them up for failure. Yes, we've kind of gotten them through the education phase, but who's going to support them once they get in the workplace? So the most impactful thing every single one of you can do is to look in your own backyard and figure out what kind of support women in your own workplace need, especially the women in the middle of their career, they get the least amount of support. Graduates get so much training and then you get lots of training when you become a manager or senior leadership. But as we saw from the stats before, women drop out in that middle level and we don't get any training when we're in mid-career. So what can you do to support them? Is that giving them coaching opportunities, learning and development training opportunities, teaching them how to influence, teaching them how to um, negotiate, speak to clients, what is it that they need, identify that and help them to push into those leadership levels so that when these girls in schools come up, they have these role models to look up to and to foster their growth when they get into the workplace. There's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a good rant, great rant, and thank you so much for your time today, Tiff. I think that's all we've got time for, guys. Um, we will be putting on more engineering meetups in the future. Um, it'd be great to have you guys all here. Thanks very much for coming. If you've got any topics that you'd like to hear about, um, we're all ears. Um, it's always good to hear hear what you guys think is, is a good topic to hear about in the future. Um, if you guys would like to do a talk or, or know anyone that you think would be would be useful to, to spread out to the industry, then yeah, please, please do fire away. Um, we'll get in touch with, um, with, with as many of you as possible just to thank you personally for, for being here um, and hopefully see you again in the future. Uh, just before we go, are, are there any questions at all from, from anyone else? Uh, just, just one from me, Mark Heath here at McLaren. So thank you, Tiffany. I thought that was great. It's very practical and there's things we can be doing now. That's, re that's really good. I've worked, um, I, I'm from a sort of tech background rather than engineering, and I've worked with teams in India and Romania that were 35% uh, plus women software engineers. And it was great to see, and that's, that seems to be quite normal there. And it's, I, I wonder, obviously it's a big question as to how we've got into this situation where it's normal in these, you know, there's the one example, there's a former communist country. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but lots of really great w women engineers, a much higher proportion of women software engineers in the workplace, same in India. I, I just whether you could point us to any papers or resources as to as to the, the sort of deeper questions as to why that why that is what's the what's the difference how do they do so much better than... yeah um shoot me an email i've got something i'd, I'd love to send oh, to you. you um i can't remember the name of it i think it's called something like the gender diversity paradox and and it's a good observation that you've made in a lot of countries that are less well off than us in the uk you will see that in tech and engineering there are higher percentages of women mm. working in them. Um, the theory is that in those countries, the most important thing is to make money because they, you know, they don't have access to the riches and, and comforts of life that we have. And engineering and tech are industries that can go in to earn well and earn quickly. Mm. Um, whereas in places like the UK and Australia and America, we have those comforts. So more women are kind of discouraged from entering those fields because they don't necessarily need to make money quickly to support their families to okay. live. So they draw on whether they feel comfortable studying these topics. And, you know, as an engineering 
um, student myself, it was very uncomfortable, especially going to a girl's school my whole life. I then stepped into four years of, you know, being surrounded by, you know, 200, 300 men in a lecture theatre. And I felt out of place and it's uncomfortable. And you have to really, really love and be passionate about the topic before you have the resilience to keep going in those um, tough situations, tough social situations. So that's a that's an Great. overview, but I'll, I'd love to send you something if you can shoot Great, me Great, thanks, email. I'll drop you an email, thank you. No problem. Cool, guys. I think that's that's about it for us. Thank you very much for joining our first engineering meetup. Hopefully, we'll see you all again soon. Uh, we'll be in touch, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, as, as Tiff said, if you've got any questions directly for her, her details are, are on the screen right now. Um, again, if, if you, I think a few people have asked for the video for this. So yeah, we'll get in touch with, with people directly for that. And if you've got any questions for me or IO Associates, please do, um, yeah, please do reach out. But guys, thank you so much for your time and hopefully see you all again soon.